On the second anniversary of the Iraq conflict, Panorama's John Ware examines what the Prime Minister didn't tell us before going to war. Two years ago tonight, the Prime Minister was preparing to broadcast to the nation. He was taking the country to war. Tonight, British servicemen and women are engaged from air, land and sea. Their mission? To remove Saddam Hussein from power and disarm Iraq of its weapons of mass destruction. Mr Blair had said the intelligence services had showed beyond doubt that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. There has been a, a, a real concern on our part not to exaggerate the intelligence that we get. Yet, some of Mr. Blair's claims about the intelligence were exaggerated. The intelligence picture they paint is one accumulated over the last four years. It is extensive, detailed and authoritative. We now know that was not quite the picture the intelligence services painted to him. He knew perfectly well what he was doing. I think it was a lack of candor. I cannot bring myself to say that I misrepresented the evidence since I do not accept that I did. But there are many in the country who think he did. The government perhaps allowed the public to be misled as to the degree of certainty about weapons of mass destruction. The Prime Minister remains utterly convinced he was right to take military action. This is the story of what Mr Blair didn't tell us before sending British troops into battle. What I do not in any way accept is that there was any deception of anyone. Is he someone whose word you still trust? I personally don't trust him, no. No, not on... This was such a fundamental such an important, such a huge thing to send young men off to war. I'm afraid the government did not tell the whole truth about the alleged threat that Iraq posed. That's why I think it's a tawdry story. On Friday the 8th of March 2002, a top secret briefing paper on Iraq was sent to the Prime Minister. It was almost exactly 12 months before he took Britain to war. Come in. Morning, Tony. Mr Blair was told the Bush administration was considering overthrowing Saddam Hussein. An invasion was the only way of doing this but it would require a legal justification. The Prime Minister was advised none currently exists. Nevertheless, Mr Blair would make a commitment to regime change. This would be a radical departure in British foreign policy, which he withheld from most members of his cabinet. On Monday morning, the American Vice President Dick Cheney arrived at number 10. The Prime Minister had been briefed that Saddam posed no greater threat now than in recent years. Cheney, are we going to war with Iraq? But at his press conference, Mr Blair made no mention of that crucial qualification. He had decided that he and President Bush were going to row back the tide of proliferation and that Iraq was the place to start. What evidence can you lay before the world that Saddam Hussein uh, does have or shortly will have the capability to threaten not only his own people but countries uh, in Western Europe and indeed the United States itself? If I can answer first of all that there is a threat from Saddam Hussein and the weapons of mass destruction that he has acquired is not in doubt at all. Of course Al-Qaeda would use chemical or biological or even nuclear weapons of mass destruction if they could. The next day in Washington, Mr Blair's foreign affairs and security advisor met the Bush administration. 
Sir David Manning sent a note to Mr. Blair of his conversation. What Sir David said leaked out last autumn. We spent a long time at dinner on Iraq. It is clear that Bush is grateful for your support and has registered that you are getting flack. I said you would not budge in your support for regime change. I think the real dishonesty of the government's position is that Tony Blair could not be frank with the British people about the real reason why he believed Britain had to be a part of invasion, which was to prove to the United States president that we were his most reliable, most sound ally. Uh, that was why he committed himself to President Bush. I don't deny that Tony Blair genuinely believed that there were illegal weapons inside Iraq. But the evidence for it was always very thin. But he the, believed it. The, the reality is that he believed in the evidence because he needed to believe in the evidence. Mr. Blair was certainly warned the intelligence was thin by the government's key joint intelligence committee. Although the committee advised that Saddam was able to produce chemical and biological agents, they also said there was no firm evidence he was still making weapons. And Mr. Blair was told the available intelligence was sporadic and patchy. What little intelligence there was coming in from Iraq was seen by the chief intelligence analyst on weapons of mass destruction at the Ministry of Defense. The intelligence we had certainly um, wasn't detailed. I mean, this was, was one of our major problems. There were um, some very um, general um, statements in intelligence that raised suspicions, but it, it, it certainly didn't, um, didn't allow definitive statements or definitive assessments to be made. In Washington, the British ambassador had been discussing Mr. Blair's commitment to regime change with the Bush administration at Sunday lunch. Memo to Sir David Manning, number 10 Downing Street. Confidential and personal. Sir Christopher Mayer reported back to number 10 on this latest meeting. Point two on Iraq, I opened by sticking very closely to the script that you used with Condé Rice last week. We backed regime change, but the plan had to be clever. And failure was not an option. It would be a tough sell for us domestically. Tony Blair! No justice, no peace! But number 10 already had a plan for this. Alistair Campbell, Downing Street's communications chief, told American reporters last week that a dossier of allegations compiled by Whitehall and the intelligence services would be presented publicly. The dossier would prove, sources in London said, that Saddam is manufacturing weapons of mass destruction. The Prime Minister is set to use the dossier of death to convince Britain to join the US in attacking Iraq. In Whitehall, Officials liaising between the intelligence services and the media on sensitive issues heard there was disquiet at using such weak intelligence for public relations. In charge of the Defence Notice Committee was Rear Admiral Nick Wilkinson. The middle-ranking people had severe doubts, and that was apparent you know, to me and people like me. Mm. They knew that Saddam Hussein had had weapons of mass destruction and uh, an R&D capability. They were not sure what he'd done with it since the first Gulf War. Um, so they thought he could have it, but they weren't sure. But the Prime Minister was sure. In fact, he said he was certain. We know that he has stockpiles of major amounts of chemical and biological weapons. On what did Mr. Blair base this assertion? No recent assessment from the Joint Intelligence Committee had claimed as much. 22nd of March 2002. Confidential and personal to the Secretary of State headed Iraq advice to the Prime Minister. 
The political director of the Foreign Office, Peter Ricketts, wrote a candid note to the Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw. He advised that the Prime Minister and the President should get the threat in perspective. First, the threat. The truth is that what has changed is not the pace of Saddam Hussein's WMD programs, but our tolerance of them post 11 September. To persuade the public war might be necessary, Mr Ricketts said the government would have to be more convincing. To get public and parliamentary support for military operations, we have to be convincing that the threat is so serious, stroke imminent, that it is worth sending our troops to die for. The Prime Minister made his claim about Saddam having stockpiles of weapons as he was about to meet President Bush at his ranch in Texas. Number 10 seems to have had high hopes of Mr. Blair's influence over Mr. Bush. The word that is being used in Number 10 quite remarkably, I think, uh, is that Tony Blair regards himself as President Bush's strategist when it comes to Iraq. He is as keen, at least as keen, as President Bush to see the end of Saddam Hussein and wants him out. Um, what they will be discussing is how to get there. The president wanted to know from his closest ally if he could expect coalition forces to help an invasion. Mr. Blair wanted to know if Mr. Bush would revive the Middle East peace process before any bombing started. But this seems not to have been set as a condition by Mr. Blair. It was more of a big ask an official present at the summit told us. We'll see everybody tomorrow. Mr. President, will the secretary... As I said, we'll see you tomorrow. Sounds good. And I know you can't wait, and neither can I. <laughs> okay. Neither can the Prime Minister, for that matter. Privately, Mr. Blair had already promised the Bush administration he wouldn't budge in his support for regime change. But as Number 10 had also explained to the Americans, Mr. Blair had to manage a press, a parliament and public opinion that was very different from anything in the States. So the Prime Minister was much more nuanced in public than his host about his policy. Good morning. You know, it has always been our policy that Iraq would be a better place without Saddam Hussein. But how we now proceed in this situation, how we make sure that this threat that is posed by weapons of mass destruction is dealt with, that is a matter that is open. And when the time comes for taking those decisions, we will tell people about those decisions. This seems to have been too coded for the plain speaking president. He left no doubt about where he was going. Maybe I should be a little less direct and be a little more nuanced and say we support regime change. In New York, at Britain's UN mission, the diplomat responsible for Iraq had no idea Number 10 was now committed to helping the Americans overthrow Saddam. In meetings with other diplomats, he was still promoting British policy towards Iraq as being the containment of any threat through sanctions and weapons inspections. This is what we were instructed to say. The public argument was, of course, that it was illegal. Um, you can't just go around and topple governments you don't like, that's not legal. Um, and that's what we would say in the UN, because the UN is a place of law and of rules. But privately, what we would discuss with our, our allies was that we thought it was a bad idea, because we thought it would be destabilizing and could potentially lead to chaos in Iraq. He must have felt, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, a bit of a prat. I mean, talking to the State Department, promoting one policy, when in fact, presumably people in the State Department, that knew jolly well that the part of the government, the British government, that really mattered, namely Downing Street, was promoting a completely, was signed up anyway to a totally different policy. Yes, I think that's more or less right. Blair dossier on Iraq is delayed indefinitely. In London, there was still no sign of Number 10's much heralded intelligence dossier, which promised to show why Saddam was a threat to Britain. Someone else said to the FT, it was insufficient to convince critics within the Labour Party that the full-scale offensive against Iraq was justified. Is that why it was pulled? No, and it wasn't pulled. Both of those things are absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong? A memo has since been leaked that shows 
The Financial Times was on to something.